have each and every one of you uh, here this morning. Uh, it's good to have Angel. I'll call you Angel instead of what Walter calls you. <laughs> good to have Tom and his wife and just uh, Ron, uh, Nick with us. Uh, are you having a uh, fundraiser? Is, if you want to announce that. Just want to let some of you all know in case, because you knew Ron, and uh, you may want to go there and support that. Uh, that's a picture of our newest addition to the family. And I had a little thing I set under it, and I sent a lot of people. Turkey makes me sleepy. Okay? Hopefully, all the turkey is out of our system now. <laughs> okay? We don't want you going to sleep this morning. Okay? I want to thank Brother Hank for filling in for me so faithfully. Anytime I'm gone, uh, I was not supposed to be here this morning. We came home early. I texted Brother Hank and said, we're coming home Saturday night instead of Sunday afternoon. So he texted me back and uh, he said, do you want to speak? And I texted him back. I said, uh, it's up to you. If you're ready, go ahead. And he sent me back. He said, you're the man. In other words, I'm the pastor. So uh, here I am. Uh, and after we got done texting back and forth, uh, a flood of thoughts, Brother Curtis, just came to me. I began writing them down and, and what have you. And if you were here last Sunday, we talked about uh, a prison break today, pass it on. And after our message this morning, uh, Andrew, if you will, we got a testimony uh, from him. Uh, we talked about what transpired last week and how God blessed in a special way. Title of the message this morning is if you're fr out, out of that prison break, if you're free now, now what? Okay? If you're free, what are you doing with your freedom? Uh, 
I'm going to go back to one of the scriptures that I used last Sunday. There's two scriptures I'll be referring back to. The first one is found in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 25 and 26. This is when Paul and Silas were thrown in prison. And, and I talked about if you're a prisoner and need to be set free, there's two types of prisons. One is the physical that restrains you. And the other is mental and spiritual that tries to hold you back as well. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. Think about this. Here you are, you're in prison, and let's have a pity party. Woe is me. You know, what's that song in Hee Haw? Gloom, despair, and misery on me. Deep, dark depression. You know, and if it weren't for bad luck, we wouldn't have any luck at all. No, they were thrown in prison. And you need to know something. Before they were thrown in prison, you know what happened to them? They were lashed. And the standard lashing was 39 times they were beat. And every time they were beaten, if it was a cat of nine tails, it left nine things upon your, your body. So it wasn't just like a one smack and you're done. I mean, they were bloodied. And when they finally got to their prison cell, you know what they did? They prayed. Uh, I got a little plaque uh, when I was down in Portsmouth. My uh, wife's twin sister's husband has passed away. And he bought this for me, and they finally gave it to me. He, he died before he gave it to me. And it says ASAP, A-S-A-P, stands for always stop and pray. When things get out of control, always stop and pray. If you want God to answer ASAP, well then always stop and pray. And they sang praises unto God. And see, they must have done it loud enough, Sister Joan, that all the prisoners heard them. And because they were praising God and singing, irregardless of the situation they were in, God sent a great earthquake and shook the very foundation. You know, if things are holding you back, uh, God can shake that foundation loose. And after that earthquake came, and the prison doors were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, just not Paul and Silas. I want to think about that. Sometimes when we magnify God and God blesses us, People around us are also blessed. When the Bible talks about our cup being full and running over, if you're near the person whose cup is full and running over, you're going to get some of that blessings. I love to get beside people that are blessed. Not that I receive anything, Sister Betty, as far as monetary or materially, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. And when they're happy... It makes me happy. You know, there's a saying. You ever hear this one? If mama's not happy, nobody's happy. So the goal in life is to make mama happy, and then everybody's happy. Okay? I see a newlywed bride back there grinning like, yeah, that's right. Well, you know, we, we need to find a place by God that we make him happy and that we're pleasing in his sight. Now I'm going to go into another part of this verse. I didn't go into that this Sunday. See, now, now they're free. And the keeper of the prisons awakened out of his sleep. And seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. See, his job, his responsibility, to make sure all the prisoners were kept. Well, when the earthquake came, it woke him up. You know, I believe that spiritually God is starting to shake the foundations of the belief systems of the world. And people are starting to wake up and realize that their vote counts. Realize that we're not supposed to be the silent majority. And it says here, and he would have killed himself because he thought the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried out a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Paul and Silas didn't plan to leave. But how about the other prisoners? They didn't have that relationship that God had. But there was a peace of God that passes understanding that came down upon everybody. And they all stood in the presence of God. Then he called for a light and sprang in 
and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Now, I want you to consider this. It was darkness in there. And he heard the voice of Paul. He didn't see Paul. He cried for a light, and he took it in there. And when he found Paul and Silas, they bowed down. And he said, and he brought them out, saying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You may feel that you're bound sometimes in your job and different things that you do. I, I told this story. Before I retired, I received a memorandum from Richmond, Virginia, uh, as a comprehensive services coordinator. Uh, I was to tell all my assessment teams the following, and I read it. Due to being politically correct, we are no longer supposed to wish people Merry Christmas. We are supposed to say Happy Holidays, and, you know, it went on and on and on like that. And so I had to read that to my assessment team. Sister Betty, I had to read that. And then I said, I only have one thing to add to this after I've read it. And they said, what's that, bud? I said, Merry Christmas. Okay? See, we, we, we have to take a stand in the day and time that we're living in. Satan will try to put up roadblocks. But I'm here to tell you, what you believe in, we are to fear God more than man. Man can make a law... And sometimes, if we're not careful, we try to become so politically correct that we start losing what we're supposed to be doing. We are held in prison sometimes only because we allow ourselves to be held in prison. Now, the next part of verse 16, uh, and, and as I, I thought of this, uh, I really uh, got tickled. And when it was day, the magistrates sent to the sergeant saying, let those men go. Well, they were already free. They just didn't leave the premises. They weren't behind the bars. They just were there. And the innkeeper, well, let me go back this a little bit. The, the uh, sergeant did take them home, cleaned their wounds, and their household was saved, and they went out and got baptized. Okay? And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates now have sent to let you go, and now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul, okay, listen to this. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now they do thrust us out privately, nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. Sometimes when we get between a rock and a hard place, we as Christians want to put our towel between our legs, metaphorically speaking, and just go off into the sunset. But you know what these guys did? Now, wait a minute. You came and took us publicly, and you beat us. You shamed us. You threw us into prison. And now you're telling us just to go quietly out into the sunset and just be good boys. Well, you know what Paul did? He said, we were Romans. Uncondemned Romans, and we were beaten. You know what could have happened to those people? They would have received stripes. And so Paul just said, well, if you want us to go out, you come and fetch us and put us out. I don't believe that he was having a temper tantrum, Brother Curtis. I don't believe that he was being selfish in his approach. But I do believe that he, he received a spiritual backbone that said, hey, I want the people to see what you did was wrong. Acts 14, verse 19b, the last part in verse 21. Talking about Paul. And having stoned Paul, this is another time, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Now, what that means is they stoned him, Brother Tom, and they thought the man was dead, so they drug him, they drew him out of the city. And I guess they just threw his body where people that were stoned were supposed to be. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about, what happened? He rose up. He wasn't dead. He was apparently either not unconscious or God just caused him to go to sleep. Now you might say, oh, God can, God can protect you in the midst of the storm. You can be in the eye of the storm and God still protect you. And he rose up and came into the place that stoned him, into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and had taught many and returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, and he preached. See, sometimes when we're set free, 
we don't want to be around. You know what a lot of times people are told, and I understand this, when you first get saved, you may have to lose some friends. Okay? I understand that concept. But I also understand the power of God that can make you go back to where your friends are and let them see the new you. That new creature the Bible talks about who became new. All things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. Uh, you see, Paul said at one place, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. They need to see a different us, amen? Over in uh, Luke, the 15th chapter, verse 17 and 18, this was the second type of prison I was talking about. It wasn't a physical prison. It was a mental, emotional, or a spiritual prison. This is talking about the prodigal son. And before I get into, well, let me read this one first. And when he came to himself, when he realized what condition he was really in, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say, or say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Now this was a rich young man. When he left his father's house, he had a responsibility when he was in the home. Because the elder son, if you know your Bible, remained in the fields and worked. I don't believe he was the only son that was out in the field and working. I believe the younger son was also. You know, there's plenty of work to do. Amen? In the Navy, if, if they caught us sitting around idle, uh, if you can't find something to do, we'll find something for you. I made the mistake in boot camp one day that said, how many here know how to drive? And boy, I raised my hand. And they gave me a push broom and said, drive it around. I did all afternoon. I drove that push broom all around. I learned not to volunteer in the Navy again. Okay? But now we're in the army of God. He needs volunteers. Amen? And I, I'm persuaded to believe if he handed me a push broom, Brother Ron, there was a reason for that push broom. I can remember one time in, in boot camp, uh, there were two of us uh, as religious petty officers. One was a Catholic boy and, the, and then myself. And we would have services for the people. And sometimes it got a little bit rowdy. And, and the other uh, chaplain, so to speak, would uh, cuss and get their attention and have them calm down and then have church. Uh, I had a different approach. <laughs> okay, I didn't feel I could do that and, and have the respect of God, let alone the people. And, and we were working one day, field day, in the floor, scrubbing the floor. If you've never scrubbed the floors for the military, you've missed a good experience. And one of the guys came near me, and he said, Bud, I need to ask you a question. What church do you belong to? And I looked at him, and I said, well, the church of God of prophecy. And he said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. He said, I used to attend. I used to know God. I don't know him anymore, and I don't think he knows me. And I talked to him, and uh, we had a prayer. And later on, when he got shipped to where he was going, I went to, he wrote me a letter. He said, Bud, I've rededicated my life. I got born again. I am thank God. And I thought, you know, Lord, if the only thing that happens in my four years in the Navy is that, it has been worth it. It was not the only thing, because we have to realize who we are, where we are, and do what he wants us to do. He came. And Brother Hank came up and was the prodigal son. And when he came, uh, the Bible says his clothes were rent. Okay? And I imagine he just came out of the pig pen, so I don't think he smelled very good. And I don't believe it was very clean. And the father, when he saw him coming afar off, ran. He ran. And he hugged him and he kissed him on the neck. And, and this is the part I want to get to. When he left his father's house, did he look like that when he left? No, he had the finest of robes. He had the best sandals of shoes. He had a ring of authority and power on him. People knew who he was. And when he came back, the father knew who he was. But I'll guarantee you there are people that went by him as he came home who had no idea who that person was. You know, I have seen people that one time had the joy of salvation. And for whatever reason, the devil got them into a mental and spiritual prison. And I've seen them later in life and I thought, I can't believe that's the same person. 
They don't even, physically they don't even look the same. Why? Because of the stress and the spirit, Sister Betty, they got a hold of them. But then I've seen, seen them come back home and all restored. You know, the Bible promised that he would restore what the canker worm's eaten. And part of that is your attitude. Part of that is your facial expression. Esau gave up his birthright for a bowl of pottage. He thought, well, I'm at the point to die, and what good is this birthright going to do me? So he, he just gave it up. For whatever reason, when the man came back to his father, I, I don't have this on the slide, Sister Kim, but in verse 22, the father said, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Sister Gail, yeah, that's what I was writing down while you were teaching. I wasn't uh, getting away from what she was teaching, but her anointed teaching just sparked my heart and mind on this. It said, and put the best robe on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bible doesn't bear it out, but I believe that when he left his father's house, he had his ring on, his signet. People knew who he was, and he was proud of who he was. But for whatever reason, Brother Hank, when he came back, he had no resemblance of the man that left that house. He didn't even have his ring, didn't even have his authority. You know, you get away from the Spirit of God, you don't have that joy of salvation. You can't say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast in the sea anymore, because you don't have that authority. So they put the ring on him, and they put the best shoes on him. Verse 24 says, my son was dead and is alive. When he was in the pig pen, he might have physically been his son, but he was dead. And he, he is alive again. He was lost and is now found. Thank God that when we get into prisons that are not spiritual or not physical, he has a way to set us free. Ephesians 5, 14 and 17. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Just as Paul and Silas, when they were set free, became fishers of men once again. When we get out of our mental prisons, and that, that can be addictions or it can be anything, but when you are set free, we need to find out what the will of God is. There's a verse that sometimes I refer to several times. Uh, the man who had the legions of devils and they bound him with chains and, and uh, he would break them and, they, and he'd run around naked. Well, when Jesus came by, he took care of that, didn't he? He sure did. And when the people came back, the man whom they were afraid of, they found him clothed and in his right mind, and you know where he was? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Sister Gal, as I was studying that, I thought, you know what? That's a good plug for Sunday school. When you're set free, you need to be in the house of God. And while you're coming, you might as well learn to sit at the feet of Jesus while it's being taught, the word. Just not preached, but taught. Amen? The Bible says in, in, in Proverbs one place, it says a, a little slumber, a little sleep, a little folding of the hands. In fact, the first part of this says, go to thou sluggard. Okay? You know, when you fold your hands, you know what happens? You're not doing any work. Ecclesiastes says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. When God sets you free from the prison, we are to find the will, what the will of God is and then do it with all of our might. Colossians, the first chapter, verses 9 through 11. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with, all, with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in what? Every good work. And increasingly in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Long suffering. Not everything's going to be great. When little children come along, you know, they're work. 
Oh, they're nice to hold and pass them back to whoever they belong to, but take them home with you. They want fed at 3 o'clock in the morning. You can say, ah, give me a couple more hours and I'll take No, they are demanding. I mean, they want fed and they want fed right now. If they want change, they want change right now. You know what happens sometimes if we're not careful? A church will cease a desire to increase our borders because there's a lot of work to it. New Christians come in. And sometimes they're a, they're a handful. Have you ever seen mothers try to teach their children how to cook? If you're not careful as a mother, you'll say, it's easier for me to do it than to have you try to learn and then me clean up all the big mess. But if you're patient and long-suffering, there'll come a day in time. My wife said on the way home uh, yesterday, she said, you know what, I'm looking for the day and time we have a great big dinner, and one of our kids are going to say, my place. But you know what she said at the end of that? I'll cook all I can and take it with me. So it wasn't that she was trying to get out of the cooking, okay? And I thought, yeah, that's Faye. She loves to cook and do that kind of stuff. So she wasn't trying to get out of it, Brother Jerry. She just said, oh, you know, and then she threw in, but I'll, I'll cook it and take it with us. If you love to do something, don't give up on it. Amen? Don't, if you retire, don't sit in the easy chair. Thank God for your retirement. Uh, Sister Gail says, I'm looking forward to retirement. Why? It's a great grandchild coming along. Is that right? And she said, I'm going to take care of that boy. It's going to be a boy. And she's going to have herself a time. But you know, as you realize how much older we get in life, we love taking care, but all oh, thank the Lord they're not ours. We can send them back home. Amen? Well, you know, we need to take care of the sheep because Jesus told us to feed, feed my sheep and take care of them until they can go back home with great joy. Galatians 6 and 10. I, I threw this one in and I, I wrestled with it, but I thought, you know what? If, I, if I'm set free and out of prison, this does apply. We have, therefore, opportunity. What's an opportunity? Anything you make it out to be. Sometimes we don't look for opportunities. I started taking my grandson, Sammy, fishing. And I thank God he wanted to go fishing because now I'm doing something that I like, I enjoy. So I'm taking me fishing and taking him along. Okay? And you know what I'm doing, Brother Jerry? Building a bond there. And what I'm doing, I'm irritating the daylights out of them because I'm the better fisherman. And I remind them of that all the time. I'm looking for a video, Fishing for Dummies. And I'm going to give it to them. Or a book. Okay? When we go out, it's competition is on. Don't you, don't you take it easy on them? No. I want the biggest fish. I got the first one. And I remind them of it. If he's fishing and he gets excited and the lure goes in the tree... Danny, I'll say, fishing for flying fish? What are you doing, boy? You know, and he'll just, he, oh, I, I don't want you to see that, Papa. And I look for all these things to egg him on. But you know what that's doing? That's building a rapport. That's building a fellowship. And Ron, when he caught a catfish and I didn't, he reminded me who caught the catfish. Well, see, we're supposed to be fishers of men. Doesn't the Bible say to provoke one another unto good works? I want to see someone bring someone in who got set free out of their prison and saved, come to Christ as their personal Savior, and I want to sit there and say, if he can do it, I can do it. Lord, you're no respecter of persons. I want to be your hand extended, reaching out to the day and time we live in. I, I want to be able to be like the man who you entrusted, and you gave him two talents, and he, he got two more. He said, let us... Therefore, have opportunity and let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. You here today are part of this household of faith. We're supposed to be doing good one for another. And sometimes you have to find that opportunity. And it's not the great big things that we do that make all the difference. Sometimes it's the small things. And sometimes you'll do things that nobody will ever see. But I need to tell you something. What you do in secret, he'll shout from the rooftop. 
He'll show people how blessed you are. My last verse is found over in Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, a living sacrifice has the opportunity to get off the altar. We're not robots here this morning. We're all free moral agents. We can be like the prodigal son who decided, I want my inheritance, and I'm going to go out here and live it up. But just remember, when he was out there, he became dead. When he came back, I don't know where his ring went. He may have hawked it. I don't know. He may have lost it. The Bible doesn't say. But when he came back, he didn't have that authority that he had when he left. But the father just cleaned him up, put the ring back on, and it was though he had never even left. Isn't that a loving father? If you want to be set free from prison... He can set you free. We have a minister in the state, a close friend of mine. I'm, I'm not going to say his name. I've known him most of his life. I mean, I knew him when he was that big. Okay, And for whatever reason in school, uh, the school system failed him, and he doesn't really know how to read or write. And at this day and time, that's a sad situation. But you know what God has blessed him with? A wife who will read to him. And he's eventually learning how to read. But because he struggles in it, sometimes he can't maneuver through the scriptures. But I saw him at the pastoral retreat we had at Camp Loman. And he's doing so, and, and we were, he was taking notes. And I just sort of smiled. And I thought, ah, I see. Uh, you force yourself to do something, and you'll learn how to do it. If you're shy, you know what you need? When I was going to college, my grammar was so poor in, in Pennsylvania growing up, it was, you know, I, I grew up where they, you ever hear the saying, throw mama from the train a kiss goodbye? Well, it sounds like you're throwing mama from the train, doesn't it? Okay? Throw mama from the train a kiss goodbye. I, I had double superlatives and all these things. I don't know what that even means today, but my wife does. So God placed somebody in my life that gently began to massage me as I would speak. When I went to Idaho State University, I had to take electives. You know what I did? I took English composition courses. Oh, why did you do that? I had to learn how to do it properly, how to do it correctly, because I was working for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I was in a prison, and I wasn't about to let my shortcomings stop me. See, we, when, when I felt called to preach... I refused it because I was born with a cleft lip and a cleft palate and I had a full scholarship to Penn State University given to me. Took some tests, full ride. And they said, what do you want to be? It's yours. I said, I want to be a teacher. I've always wanted to be a history teacher or a math. You know what they said? Because of your speech, you should never become a teacher. Your students won't understand you. So guess what happened when God called me? I withdrew. I said, I can't. Professionals have told me I should never teach. If I can't teach, how can I ever preach? But I'm here to tell you, if you are in a prison that man has set upon you, you need to turn to a living God that is more than able to make a way possible. Amen? Well, there's sometimes, how's that saying go? My tongue will cover my eye tooth and I can't see what I'm saying. That's going to happen. But it happens to everybody. So when it happens to me, I guess that's one of my Hobby Lobby things. I don't know how I say it. Did I say it right that time? I think I said it right that time. But mostly I don't say it right. And I say, well, here it is, you know. But it says to accept your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is what? Just your reasonable service. That's just your reason. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. When you are set free, you need to find out why you're set free. Amen? Oh, I, I was coming home. I was so tired. And I look, and there was these lights flashing all over the place at different times. And every time I said, oh, thank you, Lord. That's not me. And then I began to pray for these people because here it is almost Christmas time, and they probably could no more afford that ticket than fly to the moon. 
But I thought, you know what? If we would obey the law, you don't have to worry. I was obeying the law, but every time I saw them off in the bushes, you know what I did immediately? Pulled back my foot. I was doing the speed limit. I slowed down. There was something about visibly seeing that police officer there made me want to make extra sure I was okay. Have you been set free? What are you doing about it? Don't twiddle your thumbs. I'm glad to have everyone here. But you know what? Next Sunday, I'm persuaded to believe we could all bring somebody out. Influence them. Have them sitting here. You might say, oh, that's just a number. Brother Fisher had a saying, if you think numbers are just a number, uh, I bet you don't think that when your paycheck comes there. You know, if they cut it back, half of it, well, that's just a number. No, we are to be paid what we had worked for at our secular jobs. Today is the day of salvation. I'd like to have Brother Curtis, if you would, come up to the piano. You're set free. Now what? Have you found the will of God in your life? Somebody won Billy Graham to the Lord. And if they only won that one soul, look what Billy Graham has done. Somebody helped lead you to Christ. So that person who helped win you looks and say, look what they have done. Pretty soon, we're going to have five generations in our family. But you know what? Spiritually speaking, you could have five generations in less than a month. You win someone to the Lord, that's two generations. They turn around and they win someone to the Lord. That's a third generation. Thought occurred to me, what would happen in 2017 if we announced at the last Sunday in December we were taking spiritual generations? Pictures. That who you win in 2017 will be with you. Who they win will stand with you. Would you want to stand up here by yourself and have your picture taken? Would it be like the man who had one talent? Oh Lord, I still got the victory, but I have nothing to offer you. I don't believe God wants us to give him back just a breath of life. I believe he wants us. See, man became a living soul. Let us stand and have prayer. As you feel impressed, the altar's open. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne, I want to thank you for your word because your word's true. And Lord Jesus, I want you to bless the congregation. The words you laid upon our heart, Lord, we have delivered our soul in a message. If there be one here that's in a prison, a mental prison, Lord, a spiritual prison, you can set them free. And whom the Son has set free, your word says, is free indeed. We ask you to give us, Lord, this day what we need to be found faithful in the all things. We thank you for your presence. Everyone is, Lord, you have a design. Everyone who was here today was for a reason. And we pray that that reason has been fulfilled. Giving you the honor, the glory, and the praise now and forevermore. In Jesus' name.